The Ring and the Book, an Interpretation, by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug To Anne Frances Burr, for many years, the faithful and loyal friend of the author and his wife, this book is affectionately dedicated. Foreword by Orinda A. D. Hornbrook Francis Bickford Hornbrook was born in Wheeling, Virginia, now West Virginia, on May 7, 1849. He was just 37 years younger than Robert Browning, and was always pleased that his birthday fell on the same day as that of the great poet he loved and studied so many years. He was of mixed ancestry, being of Dutch and English extraction on his father's side, and, on his mother's, of German and Scotch-Irish. The name is Dutch, and tradition says that the family came from the little town of Broek near Amsterdam. He was the only child of Thomas Bickford and Jane Lopeman Hornbrook, and was named indirectly for Sir Francis Burdett, the great English radical, and a distant kinsman of the Hornbrook family. He was most patriotically and intensely American, though he was only of the first generation in this country, his father having been born in Bristol, England. His far-off ancestor went from Holland to England in 1688 with William of Orange. William the Silent was one of his great heroes, and he recalled, with pride and pleasure, that his ancestors undoubtedly fought on the dikes of Holland for the great father of his country. Dr. Hornbrook's father died when his son was in his infancy. The boy was educated in the public schools of Wheeling and took his college course in the Ohio University at Athens, Ohio, graduating in 1870. Getting a college education was no easy matter for the fatherless boy, who early showed a love of reading and study that amounted to a passion. To get the means for his college course, he did all sorts of work in vacations and odd times, shrinking from nothing, however hard and disagreeable, if it would further his cherished ambition. He early decided to go into the ministry, and was graduated at the Union Theological Seminary, New York, and later at Harvard Divinity School. He was married in 1874 to Arinda Althea Dudley, a direct descendant of Thomas Dudley, the second colonial governor of Massachusetts. They had two sons, who with the wife survive him. He had three parishes. The first was that of the Union Congregational, Trinitarian, Church in East Hampton, Connecticut. While there, he decided that his theological views were more in sympathy with the Unitarian than with the Orthodox faith, and left to take the pastorate of the first parish Unitarian Church in Western, Massachusetts. It was during his country pastorates that he made that close study of the works of Frederick W. Robertson, Cardinal Newman, and of the early fathers of the Church, for which he was afterwards noted. Dr. C. C. Everett, of Harvard University, urged him to write a book on Church history, but the time of leisure for such a work never came, and his knowledge of the subject went into his sermons and various papers. He devoted himself, with such conscientious fidelity, to the especial interests of his parishes, never, for a moment, neglecting any duty as a pastor, for even his beloved literary studies, that only untiring industry allowed him time for anything else. After three years of service in Weston, he accepted a call to the Channing Church in the neighbouring city of Newton, for which he laboured for twenty-one years, refusing calls to some of the largest churches in the Unitarian body. During his pastorate, and greatly by his efforts, the present beautiful church edifice was erected. During the last fifteen years of his life, he was a constant lecturer on literary subjects, giving courses of lectures on Tolstoy, Tennyson, Shakespeare, Browning, and many others. These he made so interesting that one busy businessman said to another, What is the use in the little time we have of trying to read books? Dr. Hornbrook gives us the cream of literature with no bother to ourselves. He was a learned and exact biblical student, 
an eloquent and winning preacher, and an ardent and loving student of the best literature. His Greek Testament and his Browning were his constant companions. He greatly enjoyed his membership in the Boston Browning Society, and served it most loyally. He was its fourth president. If an essayist fell out, he could always be depended upon to fill the vacancy. If the discussion of the paper flagged, he would brighten it with witty and entertaining remarks. His reading of Browning was remarkable for its force and its interpretative quality. It reminded those who had known him in his early years of the saying among his college friends that a great actor was spoiled when Hornbrook took to the pulpit. Those who heard him read the plea of Caponsacchi, the soliloquy of the Pope, or Guido's last frantic appeal in The Ring and the Book, had an experience they will never forget. His voice was as clear as a bell, and for the time he was the one whose words he was rendering. Some of his Browning papers, besides those on The Ring and the Book, are The Religion in Browning's Poetry, The Development in Browning's Poetry, Saul, Rabbi Ben Ezra, Caliban upon Setebos, Bishop Blaram's Apology, Paracelsus, and Browning's Five Prelates. A paper on Mr. Sludge, the medium, was published in the Boston Browning Society Papers. Dr. Hornbrook was considered by competent critics to be one of the foremost Browning students and exponents in the entire world. But though so deeply interested in Browning's thought, he did not seek to know his private life, and deplored the publication of the Barrett Browning love letters. He would not read them, nor allow them to be brought into his house. The writer well remembers, when calling with her husband on Miss Harriet Hosmer, the sculptor, an intimate friend of Browning, the indignation which both these Browning lovers inveighed against the lack of delicacy displayed in the giving to the world what should have been the heart secrets of the great poet and his wife. Clerical and literary work did not claim all Dr. Hornbrook's interest. He was a public-spirited citizen, taking a capable and interested part in public affairs. Dr. Hornbrook was a man of commanding figure and singularly individual and interesting personality, whom people on the street turned to look after and inquire who he was. Failing health, caused by intense application to study, caused him, in 1900, to resign his pastorate from the church he had served long and faithfully. When he appeared to be regaining his health, he died with tragic suddenness, Saturday, December 5th, 1903, leaving a community in mourning. The day following his death, eulogistic remarks were made on him in every church, both Catholic and Protestant, in the entire city. The rector of the nearest Catholic church told his large congregation that Newton had lost its greatest citizen, and every one of them a good friend. All missed him. The appreciation of his gracious, kindly nature was touchingly expressed to the writer by an Irishman working on the street. He took off his hat and said, You don't know me, ma'am, but I know you, and we are all sorry for your trouble. We all love the doctor, for he was the friendliest man that ever walked the streets. A bust of him is now being made by C. E. Dallin to be placed in Channing Church, Newton. The manuscript of this book was Dr. Hornbrook's last work. He finished it only a few days before his death. It is the loss of the reader that it did not have his final revision. Orinda A. D. Hornbrook, Newton, Massachusetts, October 1909 End of Foreword Section 1 of The Ring and the Book, An Interpretation by Francis Bickford Hornbrook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. The Ring and the Book The Ring and the Book appeared during the years 1869 and 1870. The earlier parts met with slight favour. The later parts were recognised as works of great power, and on its completion many persons, most competent to judge, saw in it the supreme work of a great genius. It is true that some who had been enthusiastic readers of Browning's earlier poems 
professed their indifference to this poem. I know of one of these who boasts that he never read The Ring and the Book. It is equally true that this work received cordial praise from many and different quarters. The Athenaeum declared it to be the most precious and profound religious treasure that England has produced since Shakespeare. Sidney Colvin called it a work of pregnant genius. John Morley, one of the ablest critics of England in the 19th century, wrote a discriminating and appreciative review of it, which he has included in his published works. In this, he says, when all is said that can be said about the violences which, from time to time, invade the poem, it remains true that the complete work affects the reader most powerfully with that wide unity of impression which it is the aim of dramatic art, and perhaps of all art, to produce. Dr. R. W. Church, Dean of St. Paul's, who is widely and favourably known as a student and interpreter of Dante, writes in a private letter in 1870, then came the ring and the book, and that, in the first place, satisfied a longing that I had long had, to have the same set of facts told and dealt with, not as they are in the usual novel or play, that is, with one side assumed to be the true one, but as they appeared to all manner of different people, each with his own prejudices and interests and rules of conduct and judgment, so as to have a little picture of the world judging the facts before it and next, because I found in it such piercing insight into human realities of thought and feeling, into the depths and heights of the soul, such magnanimity, such pervading sense of judgment. Browning has a poet's eye, the most comprehensive, the most searching, the most minute, for the truths of our present existence and of our future hopes, of any of our great names, Tennyson, Wordsworth, Shelley. Dr. Connop Thirlwall, Bishop of St. David's, and for thirty years the ablest thinker, the greatest scholar, and sanest intellect among the bishops of the Church of England, in one of his letters refers to the ring and the book in the highest terms. He admits, what may prove to be a comfort to many readers, that there are passages in this poem which he did not at once understand. But he attributes this, very properly, to the compactness of expression. As a recognition of the value of the poem, Balliol College, Oxford, conferred upon Mr. Browning the degree of Master of Arts, a more distinguished honour than that of D.C.L., because it makes the recipient a member of the university. Such an honour had been bestowed last upon Dr. Samuel Johnson. In view of the commendation given to this poem, we have no right to pronounce it unworthy our attention and study or to call it a poem which no one has ever cared to read. When English people sometimes say, as they do, we know nothing about Browning in England, it means only that they, and the circle to which they belong, know nothing about him. They do not speak for all England. These opinions, while they sustain me in my own view of the value of the ring and the book, have had no part in the formation of that view, and while what I may think about it cannot add to its value, I am sure that the story of my experience with it will have some interest and encouragement in it for others. It was the first poem of Browning that really impressed me, or took hold of me. Before the year 1876, I had read few of his poems, and what I had read had not attracted me. In that year, however, I came across a copy of The Ring and the Book in the library which the owner allowed me to use as my own. On my first reading, I found much in the book which seemed obscure, and I frankly confess that the connection of the thought was not always clear to me. In spite of this, it deeply impressed me, and, in some way, made me conscious that it deserved more careful reading. I found in it so much that appealed to me that I was convinced there must be much more. I determined to read it again when I could give my undivided attention to it, such a season came a few years later, when I passed my summer vacation in a beautiful and restful part of Maine. Even then, I resolved to read it no longer than my interest lasted. Under these circumstances, I began to read the poem, and continued to read it, with unabated enjoyment, to the end. I read it, as everyone ought to read poems, for pleasure, 
and I found it. A strange attraction drew me to it day after day. The only other poem which has exerted the same power over me is The Odyssey. Since then, I have read the poem throughout at least thirty times, and every time with increased pleasure. The more I read it, the more I love it, and the less I find in it to censure. Even now I do not pretend to be able fully and satisfactorily to explain every passage in it. If this be urged against the poem, it is just as true of the great poems of Shakespeare and Milton. What student of either of these poets can explain everything they wrote? Sometimes what is most poetic is least capable of strict definition. But much in the ring in the book that once seemed perplexing has become clear. Often, too, I have found that the obscurities, of which I thought I had reason to complain, were not so much in the poem as in my own mind. Some difficulties, which at first seemed hard to overcome, became easy to surmount as I grew more familiar with the style and method of the poet. Fortunately, it is not necessary to understand everything in a work of art before we can enjoy it. If it were, how many of us could say with any degree of sincerity that we enjoy Goethe's Faust? In reading the poem, several convictions have forced themselves upon me. 1. The Ring and the Book is in harmony with Browning's peculiarly dramatic genius. During the first part of his poetic career, he devoted himself to the preparation of plays for presentation on the stage. For some years his dramas appeared in rapid succession. In one of his poems, he names himself a writer of plays. But these never attained any measure of success with the public. McCready did all he could for Strafford, but even he could keep it on the stage for only a few days. Colomb's birthday and a blot in the scutcheon had the same experience. They met with some esteem, but no enthusiasm. It is sometimes said that Browning did not care for the comparative failure of his plays. I think he did care. I believe he regretted it very much. He knew he had something to say to the world in that way, and no doubt he deplored the limitations which prevented him from making an impression upon it. There are evidences that he was anxious to succeed, and that he did his best nor have his plays secured better hearing since his fame as a great poet has become general. From time to time, some of the best actors appear in one or another of his plays, and audiences who admire Browning are attracted, but it is usually evident that the actors do not understand or appreciate the characters they assume, and that the hearers do not experience real enjoyment. Yet many who do not care to see his plays acted, read them again and again with ever-increasing pleasure. It is easy to understand this. Browning had no experience of stagecraft, and he was ignorant of those devices by which plays are made effective in particular parts and as a whole. The stage was something to which he brought his play. He did not live on it. He lacked that practical training of which Shakespeare had so much. But the true cause of his failure as a writer of plays lies deeper than this. It is due to the fact that his characters reflect so much and do so little. We hear what they say, but we never see what they do. They reveal every subtle train of thought and lay bare every hidden motive. Even the most transient emotions find utterance. All this renders them delightful to the reader, but at the same time unintelligible to the hearer. Plays full of mental analysis can never be popular but Browning excels all other writers of plays in his power to make his characters reveal themselves. He enables his readers to see every movement of their souls. If he has not the genius for making persons act in relation to one another, he has the genius for dramatic monologue, in which a person, through what he says, shows what he essentially is. It was a wise instinct, therefore, that prompted Browning to abandon the dramatic form for the dramatic spirit. In The Ring and the Book, he has dropped methods not in harmony with his nature, which he could not effectively use, and has constructed it in a way that gives ample scope to the full play of his characteristic power. When we come to the poem, everything has been done, and we are asked only to see how the men and women who have taken part in the action make themselves known to us 
by the way in which they give us their version of the story. 2. The ring in the book is in harmony with the dominant characteristic of our age. No age in the history of the world was ever so much interested in studies of the mind. It is pre-eminently psychological. This appears everywhere. In our histories, which endeavour, through the phenomena of the social and political life of an era, to make us aware of the spirit that produces them, and in our works of fiction, which aim more to reveal the character and the modes of its operation than to provide descriptions of natural scenery or to portray events. Again, this psychological interest shows itself in the numerous studies of mind that are constantly being published and the constant demand for them. From studies of nature, our age has been turning more and more to the study of the mind by which alone nature can be apprehended or comprehended. Now, it is the test of a great work of genius that, while it is above the thought of the time in which it was written, it also responds to that thought. The Iliad and the Odyssey reflect the prevailing conditions of thought and feeling in the times when they appeared. Dante's Divine Comedy bears witness to the politics and religious thought of its age. Milton's Paradise Lost is an indication of the powerful influence of the Puritan spirit. It is to be expected that a great poem, belonging to the last third of the nineteenth century, should show, in its mood and spirit, the dominance of the psychological interest, and the ring in the book fulfils that expectation. From beginning to end, it is an insight into, and a revelation of, the heights and depths of human nature. The poet himself seems conscious of this when he says, speaking of the poem, it lives if precious be the soul of man to man. 3. The ring in the book shows also the influence of the spirit of historic criticism. It is sometimes said that one cannot tell to what age the poetry of Browning belongs. Anyone who reads that poetry, with his eyes open, must know better. Not to speak of other poems, the ring in the book could not have been written in any other century of the world's history. The way in which it treats its theme is necessarily connected with a time that is sceptical as to the ability of one man or one party to tell the whole truth about any matter, a time that seeks to examine many accounts before it forms a final opinion about a man, or a party, or a sect. Until within a comparatively few years, the writing of history depended on any account that had come into the hands of the historian. No attempt was made to pierce the letter of the record, or to get at the conditions which might disturb the impartiality of its author. It was tacitly assumed that Tacitus told the whole truth about the Caesars, and that Eusebius told the whole truth about the leaders of heretical sects. But now the historian makes the record before him only the starting point for his investigation. He tries to go behind the record, and to get at the peculiarities, the likes and dislikes of the writer, or the political and religious prejudices and prepossessions which swayed him. He uses him simply as one way of getting at the real truth. He compares his account, if possible, with the accounts of others. He realises how hard it is for one person to tell the whole truth. Now, in The Ring and the Book, we have an illustration and manifestation of this spirit of historic criticism which everywhere prevails. The poet does not allow the reader to remain satisfied with one version of the story which underlies his poem. He shows us how various persons, of different characters and interests, tell it, and he causes these to unfold themselves in their narratives. We may not learn from them more about the actual facts, but we know better the thoughts of many hearts. The different stories also enable us to attain to a juster, because completer, knowledge of what actually happened. In this way, the poem is a grand example of the spirit of historic criticism. Mark Patterson, in his Life of Milton, makes it clear that, being the man he was, and living at the time and in the country he did, Milton could not have chosen a better subject than the one he took in Paradise Lost. So may it be said of Browning, that one endowed with his peculiar genius, and living in an age animated by psychological interest, and historic criticism, could not have done better than to write a poem like The Ring and the Book 
in just the way he did write it, for it is an expression of what is best in himself, and also a response to the imperative demand of the dominant spirit of his time. End of chapter 1「Section 2 of The Ring and the Book – An Interpretation – by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 – The Story The story, which forms the basis of The Ring and the Book, is brief and simple. Pietro and Violante Comparini, a middle-aged married couple, lived in Rome. They were nor low in the social scale, nor yet too high, nor poor nor richer than comports with ease. Only a child was needed to make them perfectly contented with their lot. They longed for one, not merely to gratify the natural desire of their hearts, but also because they did not wish to have their little property go to unknown relatives, as it would if they died childless. At last a child was born, and named Pompilia, who remained with Pietro and Violante until she was thirteen years old. At that time, the Abate Paolo asked Violante for her as a wife for his brother, Count Guido Franceschini, a member of one of the noblest families in Arezzo, in Tuscany. Guido had been, for thirty years, a hanger-on to one of the cardinals in Rome, in the hope of obtaining place and fortune. Violante was, naturally enough, much flattered by the prospect of having a nobleman for a son-in-law, but Pietro, her husband, made inquiries among his acquaintances. They told him that, although Guido was a real count, he was just the heir to the stubble once a cornfield and brick heap where used to be a dwelling place, now burned. Upon this, he refused to consider him as a husband for his daughter. Violante, however, was determined to have her way, and so, without Pietro's knowledge, she took Pompilia to the church of San Lorenzo and had her married to Count Guido. When this had been done, and could not be undone, Pietro, though with an aching heart, consented to it. He entered into an arrangement that he and his wife should live in Arezzo, together with Guido, Pompilia, and Guido's mother, and brother Girolamo. In return for their maintenance during their lives, the little property was, on their death, to go to Guido. But the plan did not work well. The parents were unhappy in their new home, and at the end of four months left Arezzo to live, as best they could, at Rome. Nor was that all. Soon afterwards, in the holy year or jubilee, Violante confessed to the priest, who was vested by the Pope with special power of absolution, that Pompilia was not her own child, but the chance birth of a nameless drab. Pietro, learning this, saw an opportunity to escape payment of the dowry or the fulfilment of any agreement which had been made. If Pompilia was not his own child, he was not bound to pay anything. Guido, on his part, maintained that the story of Pompilia's birth was a lie, told to disgrace him and to deprive him of his right to the dowry. The court at Rome tried the case between them, and decided that while Pompilia was not the real child of Pietro and Violante, the dowry ought to be paid. This decision suited neither party, and the case was continued for further investigation. While this legal contest was going on, the life of Pompilia in Arezzo became so unbearable that one night she fled from the place in company with a young canon of the church by the name of Giuseppe Caponsacchi. The two had almost reached Rome when they were overtaken by Guido at an inn of Castelnuovo. After a stormy scene, the priest, according to his right, appealed to the court at Rome to try his case. The court there heard the statements submitted to them and gave a decision, which, trying to suit all, really satisfied none. Caponsacchi was sent for a year to live in Civitavecchia. Compilia was consigned to the care of the Convertite nuns, whose special office was the care of fallen women. Later still, she was placed in the care of her reputed parents. 
at the same time guido was not allowed the divorce which he sought in a few months pompilia gave birth to a son whom she named gaetano when guido heard of this he went with four of his retainers to rome where on a night soon after the christmas of sixteen ninety seven entering the home of pietro and violante he killed them and as he thought pompilia with them he then attempted to escape from the papal territory into tuscany where he would have been secure from all interference but before he could reach the boundary he was overtaken arrested and brought to trial for murder his defence was that the conduct of his wife justified his deed and that pietro and violante deserved death because they had aided and abetted her in it the court however refused to accept his plea and sentenced him to be beheaded and his four companions to be hanged but the case did not end here guido because he had taken some minor orders in the church and so might be called an ecclesiastic made an appeal to the pope in the hope that he might see some reason to acquit him instead of this the pope rejected his appeal confirmed the decision of the court and ordered the immediate execution of him and his companions end of section two section three of the ring and the book an interpretation by francis bickford hornbrook this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the method and the spirit the first book of the ring and the book gives the reader all the information he needs concerning its name source and arrangement in the first few lines numbers one to thirty two we learn that just as the craftsman separates the gold from the alloy by the aid of which he has been able to fashion it into a ring so the poet has wrought with the hard crude material of his story until he has at last left it a golden ring of poetry we are then told how and under what conditions the poet found the square old yellow book which contained all the bare facts he is to use and transform here we have an actual experience there is such a book and browning bought it as he says in florence on the steps of the ricard di palace for a lira or about twenty cents this book is now in the library of Balliol College at Oxford. Then follows a vivid picture of the circumstances under which the poet read the book. A book in shape, but really pure, crude fact, secreted from man's life when hearts beat hard and brains, high-blooded, ticked two centuries since. With this in his hand he walked on, so absorbed in its contents, that he noticed none of the usual scenes through which he was passing. Still read I on, from written title page to written index, on, through street and street, at the strozzi, at the pillar, at the bridge, till, by the time I stood at home again, in Casa Guidi by Felice Church, under the doorway where the black begins with the first stone slab of the staircase cold, I had mastered the contents, knew the whole truth gathered together, bound up in this book, print three-fifths, written supplement, the rest. A captious critic might suggest that a book so bulky and so difficult would hardly be read through in twenty minutes, but we must not expect too much exactness of statement from a poet. We have next the subject of the book, Romano homiciliorum, nay, better translate, a Roman murder case, position of the entire criminal cause of guido franceschini nobleman with certain four the cutthroats in his pay tried all five and found guilty and put to death by heading or hanging as befitted ranks at rome on february twenty two since our salvation sixteen ninety eight wherein it is disputed if and when husbands may kill adulterous wives yet scape the customary forfeit the poet now narrates the fanciless facts, just as they lie recorded in the old yellow book. In these commonplace incidents of the course of a murder trial, we have the untempered gold, the fact untampered with, the mere ring metal ere the ring be made. But what has come of it? It has no power to live, 
or else it would be still living in the memories of men. Now, however, it lives only in this book, which, if it were destroyed, would leave Guido and Pompilia in absolute oblivion. Then, too, how little the crude fact gives us. From it we learn nothing about Giuseppe Caponsacchi, his strange course in the matter. Was it right or wrong, or both? From it we learn nothing about either the old couple, Pietro and Violante, or the child of Guido and Pompilia, Gaetano. Nobody, the poet continues, has any recollection of the story, and he is unable to awaken any interest for it in the minds of those to whom he tells it. All records of it had long ago been destroyed. Those hostile to the church, when they found there was nothing in it against the church, but rather something in favour of it, cared to hear no more about it, while those friendly to the church promised him help if he became a convert to it. These latter ask him, Do you tell the story now, in offhand style, straight from the book, or simply here and there, the while you vault it through the loose and large, hang to a hint? Or is there book at all? And don't you deal in poetry, make-believe, and the white lies it sounds like? To these the poet answers, yes and no. He used his fancy in reshaping the story, as he claims he had a right to do, since fancy with fact is just one fact the more. With the aid of his fancy he tells the story again, and now it assumes a more living character. As we read, we come into closer relations with the actors in it, and we catch a glimpse of the motives of their actions. We are no longer dealing with past history, but the tragic piece is enacted before our eyes. We see what before we have only read about. For some poets, this would have been enough. Not so for Browning. He seeks to make the old woe live again as it lived in Rome two centuries before. To do this, he interfuses it with the motions of his own spirit. Man, indeed, cannot create out of nothing, but he can put life back into what once lived. The story of Faust is an illustration of this, but better still that of Elisha, who bade them lay his staff on a corpse face. There was no voice, no hearing. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the corpse, dead on the couch, and put his mouth upon its mouth, his eyes upon its eyes, his hands upon its hands, and stretched him on the flesh. The flesh waxed warm. And he returned, walked to and fro the house, and went up, stretched him on the flesh again, and the eyes opened. Tis a credible feat with the right man and way. In this manner the poet has unfolded the threefold method of dealing with his material. In the first place, he can state the crude fact of the story without any addition of his own. Secondly, he can add fancy to the facts, and so render them more impressive and attractive. And finally, more than that, he can inform and transfuse the facts with his spirit and make them live before us. And now a spirit lives within him, laughs through his eye and sways him as he turns the medicinable leaves. The narrative of events reveals the presence of this spirit. But the poet proposes to do even more than that. He will bring each character in the story before us and cause him to appear now as he appeared long ago in Rome or Arezzo. He will reproduce the talk of the city and cause us to hear what those who watched the drama had to say. The outline and structure of the poem grow naturally out of this. In the first book, Half Rome tells the story as it appeared to those who took the side of the husband. Then the other half Rome tells it as it appeared to those whose sympathies were with the wife. Tertium Quid reproduces the view taken of the whole affair by the superior social section. So much for the talk heard on the streets and in the drawing rooms. Now those who view the whole matter from within speak. First, Count Guido Franceschini gives an account of his life and deed, doing his best to appear in a good light before his judges. He feels he has a fist, then folds his arms crosswise, and makes his mind up to be meek. 
Next comes Caponsacchi, the priest, and we hear his voice as he speaks in tones to which, under the circumstances, his judges feel they must listen in silence. Then Pompilia, surrounded by those who watch for every word and minister to every need, sighs out, as she lies dying, her version of the affair. The lawyers appear on the scene to teach our common sense its helplessness. Hyacinthus de Archangelis writes his plea on behalf of Guido and is followed by an argument against him, framed by Dr. Johannes Baptista Bottinius. After all these comes the Pope, who must give the final decision in the case, and whose meditations we are permitted to hear as he sits, out the dim droop of a sombre February day in the plain closet. Guido speaks a second time, as he sits on a stone bench in his cell, to his old friends, the Abate and the Cardinal, and we learn from his speech how the tiger cat screams now that whined before. After this the poet promises to bring us down to the prosaic events that immediately followed the execution of Guido. Each book of the poem is a fulfilment of what is indicated here, and he who reads this first book has the story and the plan of the entire poem. Whatever doubt he may have as to the meaning of particular passages, he can have no doubt as to the arrangement and purpose of the whole. To many readers of The Ring and the Book, one account of it seems amply sufficient, and if we were concerned with the story alone, the repetition of it might be wearisome. All we can know about it is well and clearly stated in the first book of the poem. The few incidents that are added in the following books are not important enough in themselves to justify the telling of the story over again. We may assume that the poet knew this as well as any of his readers. He has deliberately chosen to allow each one of his personages to give his own version of the affair, not in order that we may know more about it, but that we may learn more of the different characters. Each narrative is a revelation of the thoughts and feelings of the narrator and discloses something of his character, so that when we have finished the poem, we know the men and women in it, as otherwise we could not hope to know them. To Browning, the incidents of the poem are of slight importance, compared with the knowledge of the persons who relate them. When, therefore, we adopt his point of view, the poem assumes an interest which grows and deepens to its completion. End of section 3. Section 4 of The Ring and the Book An Interpretation by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Half Rome and the Other Half Rome. The books of Half Rome, The Other Half Rome, and Tertium Quid are, with the exception of the pleas of the lawyers and the book and the ring, the least interesting parts of the poem. After reading the first book, one may pass to the other parts without being aware of any serious loss. But while these portions are lacking in the intense interest which belongs to those parts where the actors in the story speak for themselves, they have value and significance in the general structure of the whole poem. In these three books, Browning allows us to hear again the gossip of the street and the drawing room, as Rome heard it in 1698. The three persons who speak in the successive books are representative characters, meant to portray different phases of opinion and feeling. They make us feel as if we were living in the atmosphere of the tragic events which had just taken place, and as if we were looking at them in the light of the prejudices, special experiences, sympathies, and antipathies of those around us. As we read these books, we become aware, as we could in no other way, of the sentiments with which Rome was quivering. Browning, in fact, has not drawn these representative characters from his imagination alone. In the square old yellow book, part print, part manuscript, there are two versions of the tragic event, one written in sympathy with the husband, the other written in sympathy with the wife. From these the poet has drawn many of the statements and pleas which we find in the particular poems. Thus the poet did not create their opinions, he found them, and quickened them with the life of his own spirit. Tertium Quid, however, has been framed by Browning, 
from a comparison of what he found in the two pamphlets. In this, an attempt is made to give an impartial and balanced account of the whole story. The oftener I read these books, the better satisfied I am with them, the more conscious I am of their vital significance, and the gladder I am that they are where they are. The Ring and the Book would have lost something of its total impressiveness without these books, which the impatient reader is sometimes disposed to pass by or neglect. They contain many beautiful passages, taken singly, but their main interest lies in the comparison of the different forms which the events and characters assume as the persons in them happen to take one side or the other. If we have ever been inclined to talk of seeing things as they are, these accounts will convince us that we never do anything of the kind. We see only according to what we ourselves are. Half Rome speaks of the parents of Pompilia as these wretched comparini, and declares that Violante ought to be throttled for the deception she had practised on Pietro and Guido, while the other half Rome describes the comparini as nor low in the social scale, nor yet too high. As for Violante, her deception was well meant, nobody was consciously wronged by it, and besides, the soul of a child had been saved from destruction. These accounts of the causes and motives of the marriage of Guido and Pompilia differ in the same way. Half Rome asserts that Violante had used Pompilia as a bait to attract a husband, and that she, who had caught one fish, could make the same bait catch a still bigger one. So, her minnow was set wriggling on its barb. Guido's motive in marrying her is explained as his desire to gain a sweet drop from the bitter past, to light the dark house, to lend a look of youth to the mother's face grown meagre, and to better assert his right as elder brother in the house. Then, too, Guido was a choice catch, even if he was past his prime and poor besides. He was a nobleman, with powerful friends, and he had a palace one might run to and be safe from importunate creditors. Half Rome declares that Count Guido was made to woo, win, and wed at once, and was carried to San Lorenzo and married, or the sly there, by some priest confederate properly paid to make short work and sure, before he had time to think twice. As for Pietro, he did not know of the marriage, in order that he might later play the part of the offended and outraged father. But the other half Rome assures the reader that the marriage of Guido and Pompilia was proposed by Guido's brother, the Abate Paolo, who came to the house of Pompilia and pleaded with her mother Violante while her father Pietro took his after-dinner nap, when, later, Violante told her husband of the proposal, he was delighted until he learned from his companions that Guido was miserably poor, and that one would not look at him, or his, if he had one penny piece to rattle twixt his palms. In consequence, Pietro refused to have anything to do with the proposed marriage, congratulating himself that, while there was one hope the less, there was not misery the more. Afterward, however, without his consent or knowledge, Pompilia was taken to the church by her mother, and there married to Guido by a priest, Abate Paolo, perhaps. Then Pietro, when he could do nothing else, gave his consent, and made the best he could of a bad matter. The accounts of the old couple at Arezzo, in the palace of Guido, differ from beginning to end. Half Rome accuses the Comparini of expecting too much, and of anticipating rich banquets and lavish expenditure, as if Plutus paid a whim. But Guido was through with all that. He had found soap suds bitter to the tongue, and hoped that by pinching and paring he might furnish forth a frugal board, bare sustenance, no more, till times, that could not well grow worse, should mend. This caused an outcry on the part of the Comparini, who complained to everybody that they were compelled to house as spectres in a sepulchre, the grimmest in a gruesome town, to pick garbage on a pewter plate, that they were robbed and starved and frozen too. They called Guido's mother a doited crone, 
Dragon and Devil, and also criticised and blamed whatever his brother Girolamo did. After four months of this purgatory, Dog Snap and Cat Claw, Curse and Counterblast, they left Pompilia, bade Arezzo rot, cursed life signorial, and returned to Rome. The other half Rome informs us that the Comparini touched bottom at Arezzo. There they had four months' experience of craft and greed, quickened by penury and pretentious hate, four months' taste of apportioned insolence, of graduated cruelty and ruffianism, until, at last, they fled for their lives to Rome, deeming themselves lucky to bear off a shred of skin, while Guido remained lord of the prey. We have very different views of Pompilia's conduct at Arezzo, after the departure of her parents, in the two narratives. Half Rome says that, when the parents had gone, Pompilia, pricked by some loyal impulse, wrote a letter in which he declared that since Pietro and Violante had departed, hell was heaven, and the house was now as quiet as Carmel where the lilies live. All her complaints were due to their promptings. She further wrote that they had advised her to flee with a lover to Rome, first putting poison in Guido's cup, and stealing his money and jewels. This, half Rome assures us, is fact, and not a dream of the devil. Word for word, such a letter did she write. After this, however, Pompilia seems to have changed her mind. The house was too dull. She looked outside for life and light, and found both in Caponsacchi, for whom she was always watching at her windows. When Guido remonstrated with her about her conduct, she rushed to the governor and to the archbishop, just to torment him and make him the laughing stock of the town. The other half Rome asserts that the letter, said to have been written by Pompilia, was really written by her husband in pencil and retraced by her in ink. She was unable to write and had no knowledge of what she was induced to copy. Then Guido deliberately set himself to annoy her. He chased her about the coop of daily life and planned so that no other way of escape was left her than in the arms of Caponsacchi. When she had been forced to flee with him, Guido expected to be able to brand her as a castaway and to gain all he wished, the property and the divorce. Pompilia, maddened by her misery and not knowing what to do, appealed to the governor and to the archbishop for help, but both alike declined to interfere. Then she went to a simple friar and begged him to write a letter for her to her parents. This he promised to do, but when he reflected that writing such a letter would involve him in danger, he sighed at the mistake of matrimony and did nothing. As a last resort, she sought Caponsacchi, whom she had never seen before, and begged him to take her to Rome, and this he consented to do. Does this seem improbable? So is the legend of my patron saint. In the account of the flight of Pompilia with Caponsacchi, half Rome says that Pompilia drugged Guido, stole his money and jewellery, and having thus spoiled the Philistines, jaunted jollily with her lover to Rome. But the other half Rome claims that she rose up in the dark, laid hands on what came first, clothes and a trinket or two, and stole from the side of her sleeping husband, who was perhaps sleeping, certainly silent, and then moved, unembarrassed as a fate, from room to room to the door. Wife and priest alike reply, This is the simple thing it claims to be, a course we took for life and honour's sake. She says, God put it in my head to fly, as when the martin migrates. And so we did fly rapidly all night, all day, all night, a longer night, again, and then another day, longest of days. One thought filled both, fly and arrive. Half Rome sneers at Caponsacchi as sympathy made flesh. Apollos turned Apollo and declares that he was always felt everywhere in Guido's path. He says that Caponsacchi threw comforts to Pompilia in the theatre, pressed close till his foot touched hers, and that Guido suspected some falseness, but he could do nothing. 
the other half Rome maintains that Caponsacchi must of necessity be in Guido's way, since both of them moved in the regular magnate's march. Each must observe the other's tread and halt at church, saloon, theatre, house of play. It is not strange, therefore, that he saw, pitied, loved Pompilia. They understood each other at first look. So differ also the conceptions of Guido. Half Rome declares that he was forced by the conduct of Pietro and Violante to drive them from his home. He could not endure their clamour and the exposure they made of its poverty. After they had gone, he treated Pompilia, at first, with kindness. He did not turn her out of doors. His compassion saved her from scandal. All might go well yet. He treated her somewhat harshly only when he had reason to suspect her, only when he began to see the marks of Caponsacchi everywhere, as when the trouble of eclipse hangs overhead. Then he is harsh, because he has the right to judge. But the other half Rome states that Guido meant from the first to drive Pietro and Violante away by graduated cruelty, and that it was also his purpose to force Pompilia, by devilish devices, into a life of shame, and so to get rid of her while he retained the dowry. So should the loathed form and detested face launch themselves into hell and there be lost while he looked o'er the brink with folded arms. There are striking contrasts, again, in the judgments of Guido's motive in committing the murder and of his right to take the course he pursued. Half Rome tells us that the news of the birth of a son was the last drop which poisoned Guido to the bone. Then the overburdened mind broke down, and what was a brain became a blaze. He suggests that Guido named Caponsacchi at the door of the villa in order to make a last experiment to prove the innocence of Pompilia. He describes Guido's companions as four stout hearts who had sisters and wives. Guido, he alleges, had indeed at first appealed to the courts, but since they had given him no aid, he reverted to his original right, the right of an injured husband. True, he overdid the matter, but his deed had made it better the husbands of wives, especially in Rome. But the other half Rome asserts that Guido was moved to murder Pietro, Violante and Pompilia because when these were out of the way, his son would be heir to all the money and he himself the only custodian of the helpless infant. That he named Caponsacchi at the door of the villa showed that he knew that Caponsacchi was not within, since otherwise the man's own self might have been found inside. He designates his four companions as brutes of his breeding. After Guido's appeal to law, he had no right to resort to violence. To allow that were too commodious. It will be seen that in Half Rome we have a narrative of the affair according to those who are in sympathy with the husband Guido. It gives us, in a distinct and well-defined form, the sentiments of those who favoured his action and approved his course. The person who expresses this phase of popular feeling comes before us in a critical mood. The Roman government was, at that time, entirely in the hands of ecclesiastics, and the court was composed of those who had condemned Guido. Hence those who defended him were inclined to find fault with everything that was done or left undone. Thus half Rome begins with a word of reproach for the priests of San Lorenzo. Fie! What a roaring day we've had! Whose fault? Lorenzo and Lucina. Here's a church to hold a crowd at need, accommodate all comers from the Corso. If this crush make not its priests ashamed of what they show for temple room, don't prick them to draw a purse and down with brick and mortar, eke us out the beggarly transept with its bit of apse into a decent space for Christian ease. Why, today's lucky pearl is cast to swine. He had his contemptuous word for the wooden railing in the church, which the crowd broke, painted like porphyry to deceive the eye. He also has a keen vision for pretense, as we see in his account of the young curate, who comes into the church, mounts the pulpit, and attributes this terrible tragedy to the influence of Molinism, 
the philosophic sin, because the cardinals who had written a book on that heresy were present. He approves of the conduct of Guido, on the whole, but there is a touch of cynicism in his approval. People would care more for him if he were less known and were not still alive. Half Rome shows himself a shrewd observer of social ways. He knows how people defer to nobility, and he appreciates the value of being connected with a nobleman with friends, who has a palace in which one may be safe from importunate creditors. At the same time, he fully understands the shifts to which impecunious nobility must resort, the pinching and pairing to get bare sustenance, the cold glories served up with three Paul's worth sauce. But with all his shrewdness and keen perception of actual facts, his bias is so decidedly in favour of Guido that he takes all he says about his affairs as absolutely true. He accepts, without a doubt, the story that Pompilia wrote a letter after the departure of her reputed parents, as he accepts the correspondence between Caponsacchi and Pompilia without criticism. As he has no doubt of Guido's word, so he has no faith in Pompilia's honour. He assumes, as a matter of course, that she must be guilty of what is imputed to her, because she belongs to a certain class, and has been placed under certain circumstances. She found herself, he says, young and fair, and that her husband was old and poor, and so she did what all like her do, looked out of the window for life and liberty, and found both in Caponsacchi. He displays the same kind of class judgment when he comes to consider Caponsacchi. He was a priest, fine-looking, in great favour with society in Arezzo, and with abundant leisure, he must have done what Guido said he did. Taking for granted, as he does, Pompilia's misconduct at the inn, he sees in her act of drawing the sword of Guido and threatening his life only an exhibition of effrontery. He has only a sneer for the popular opinion in her favour. Guido, he thinks, overdid his act, but he was engaged in a good cause, in the interests of the rights of the family which he always regards as necessarily identical with those of the husband. At the close of the poem, he clearly reveals the motive which has animated him, and which, no doubt, represents the motives of many about him. He had been annoyed by the attention which the cousin of the one to whom he was talking had been paying his wife. This deed of Guido, though somewhat exaggerated, since he had killed three instead of one, had made it worse for him but the better for you and me and all the world husbands of wives especially in rome the thing is put right in the old place ay the rod hangs on its nail behind the door fresh from the brine a matter i commend to the notice during carnival that's near of a certain what's his name and jackanapes somewhat too civil of eves with lute and song about a house here where i keep a wife you, being his cousin, may go tell him so. To the other half Rome, the continued existence of Pompilia seems a miracle. She had prayed for this, and her last prayer had been answered. He notes the difference between her, as she was a few days since, when no one noticed her, and now, when the great artist Maratta declares, a lovelier face is not in Rome. He shows moral perception in his judgment of Violante, who had passed off Pompilia as her own child. At first it might seem as if she had done what was almost praiseworthy in taking her from the slums and nurturing her in a good home. What so excessive harm was done? To which, he thinks, the dreadful answer came in this tragedy which had taken place. His sympathy with Pompilia causes him to believe what the companions of Guido had said, that all of him was gone except sloth pride, rapacity. So, too, his sympathy makes it easy for him to believe that the story of Caponsacchi's conduct was no more improbable than the story of his patron saint. He believed, in the one case, what he wanted to believe. Why not in the other? Men acted from unusual motives ages ago. Why not now? Even out of his unreasoning sympathy, there had grown a noble insight. At last she took to the open, stood and stared 
with her wan face to see where god might wait and there found caponsacchi wait as well for the precious something at perdition's edge he only was predestinate to save and if they recognized in a critical flash from the zenith each the other her need of him his need of say a woman to perish for the regular way of the world yet break no vow do no harm save to himself if this were thus how do you say it were improbable so is the legend of my patron saint anyhow whether as guido states the case pompilia like a starving wretch of the street who stops and rifles the first passenger in the great right of an excessive wrong did somehow call this stranger and he came or whether the strange sudden interview blazed as when star and star must needs go close till each hurts each and there is loss in heaven whatever way in this strange world it was pompilia and caponsacchi met in fine she at her window he in the street beneath and understood each other at first look this sympathy with pompilia makes him conscious of guido's intentions he has no special knowledge of these but compassion makes him wise and he enters into the motive which pompilia says made her leave her husband's home god put it in my head to fly as when the martin migrates autumn claps her hands cries winter's coming we'll be here off with you ere the white teeth overtake flee so i fled he realizes that she obeyed the great call of nature which prompts the she-dove to seek the unknown shelter by undreamed of shores he has no patience with guido's plea that he had a right to resort to violence after he had applied to the courts to decide his case one or the other he ought to follow to take the law and then after it had failed him to resort to violence was too commodious and would not do End of section four. Section five of The Ring and the Book An Interpretation by Francis Bickford Hornbrook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five Tertium Quid. We have heard voices telling the story of The Ring and the Book as they happen to be advocates of the wife or of the husband. In Tertium Quid we hear the voice, not of an advocate, but of one who poses as judge and who sums up the possible arguments which may be urged on both sides. He is fully aware that his presentation of the affair is far superior to the popular view. There has been, he thinks, enough loose and passionate talk, and now the time has come to allow qualified persons to pronounce. Some people think law will clear it all up, but law has already failed. He recounts contemptuously the pleadings of the lawyers, expresses his gratification at being able to entertain people of quality, and, at the same time, his contempt for the mob, and then proceeds to give a detailed account of the condition and conduct of Pietro and Violante up to the time of the marriage of Pompilia. In his description of the act of Violante in passing off Pompilia, the child of a public woman, for her own, he dwells on the good as well as the evil in it. We might, he says, infer from this incident in her life that she was capable of black, hard, cold crime, like a stone you kick up with your foot in the middle of a field so he himself thought formerly, but he now considers the good that has come from her deed. The sin has saved a soul. The heirs to the property are not wronged, because they do not know they are wronged. Then he knows that Pietro was made a better man through the child. His habits are improved, he learns how to practice self-denial, and his debts are paid. Violante herself, being happy, was good. In the matter of the marriage, neither party was really deceived. Each got what he bargained for. Guido got the money, and the bride got the title. Neither party, however, obtained all he hoped 
by the transaction. The aged couple found this out first. They saw that Guido was penniless, and at once screamed, We are cheated! It was not until Guido's cruelty forced them to leave his house that Violante confessed that Pompilia was not her own child, and that Pietro saw in the confession his opportunity of revenge and advantage. But Guido retorts that he is the wronged one. He did what he promised, and conferred a real title upon his wife. That he was poor was a mere incident which might change at any time. But the old couple had promised to give him their child in marriage, and instead they had given him a drab's brat. It is hard to determine which of the two parties was cheater or cheated. Guido's treatment of his wife is explained, on the one hand, by his desire to drive her into a life of shame and to compel her to accept the attentions of Caponsacchi. On the other hand, it may be urged that it is not necessary to resort to such unusual reasons for Pompilia's conduct. The perversity and weakness of woman's nature might account for that. Then, why should Guido frighten his wife with dread of Caponsacchi if he wanted her to flee with him? The case had been heard and tried in the Tuscan courts, and they had decided in favour of Guido. How then could his conduct be such as was imputed to him? Even if he wished her to take Caponsacchi as her lover and to flee with him, how could he bring the priest, over whom he had no power, to take his part in the transaction? Admit, too, that Pompilia was wronged. Does that justify Caponsacchi's conduct and make it right for him to go journeying with a woman that's a wife. Again, it is contended by the priest that he had had no previous acquaintance with the wife, and that he felt the truth by instinct. But Guido replies that Caponsacchi did visit his wife, and that letters were carried from one to the other by a wench in his own house, and that these letters were found in the inn where they were overtaken and arrested. To this, however, reply is made by both Pompilia and Caponsacchi, that not one word in the letters was written by either of them. Guido, they say, who would profit by them, forged them. On behalf of Guido, it is urged that he had no need to resort to the devices attributed to him. He had shown himself a man of force in the end. Why should he resort to weak intrigues in the beginning? Poison, or even violence, in his own house, would, with little or no risk, have attained the same result. But to this the priest may reply, You use violence at last, because, like a fox, you will turn when caught. Then, in the end, the birth of the child made Pompilia's murder profitable to Guido. In defence of himself, the priest replied, Knowing also what my duty was, I did it. Guido's conduct when he had overtaken the fleeing pair at the inn, is capable of different interpretations. His enemies say that, having failed to act at the moment and submitted himself to the courts, he had lost all right to act afterward. But Guido's friends may urge that everybody applauded his appeal to the courts. These had really decided nothing, wavering between the two parties, and Guido, maddened by their delay, took on himself the office of judge in his own case. Even suppose he was a coward, has not a coward rights? Then, too, it may be urged, in behalf of Guido, that a wrong like his grows not less but more with the lapse of time. Pompilia's conduct in her dying hours may be capable of different interpretations. It is as explicable, on the supposition of guilt, as of innocence. Some may, and do say, that her words and prayers show that she was of wifehood, one white innocence. Others say that they only show she was consistent in her evil from the beginning to the end of her life, and that as she has braved heaven and deceived earth throughout, so now she does the same to clear her lover and convict her husband. Tertium Quid thinks there is great exaggeration on both sides. 
The wife's friends exclaim over the enormous crime committed for nothing. They will not allow that she merited any punishment. They must make her out an angel, and her parents angels too, of an aged sort. Guido can hardly be the man whose enemies suppose him to be. He is not a monster, but a mere man. His mother loves him, his brothers stand by him. The archbishop and governor of his native place know, approve, and aid him. He has cardinals who vouch for him, and one of them made the marriage for him. Can such a man commit the awfulest of crimes for nothing? It may be that Guido is innocent, and is really sacrificed to the popular clamour for justice. While Tertium Quid decides nothing, his version of the whole affair gives us the materials upon which a judgment can be based. He also provides information which, so far, we have not had, and which adds to our knowledge of some of the characters and their doings. He gives us, to begin with, the fullest account of the way in which Pietro and Violante lived, the easy self-satisfaction of Pietro in his good living, and the pride of Violante in her fine clothes. He indicates how they came to be in debt, and were compelled to seek help from the largesse of the Pope. He tells us how Violante proposes to remedy this state of things by providing an heir, how she goes to the miserable home of the future mother of Pompilia, and so overawes the poor woman with the swirl of silk that she imagines the Madonna herself has made her a visit. The woman herself is vividly portrayed, and we know her almost as well as if we had seen her washing clothes at the cistern by Cittorio. We overhear the proposition made to her to sell her future child. We have learned the fact before, but in the fuller statement it becomes more real. Tertium Quid enables us to follow Violante as she marches in triumph over the success of her scheme to the church and joins in the singing of the Magnificat. My reproof is taken away, and blessed shall mankind proclaim me now, so that the priest on the altar turns to see who offers such obstreperous praise. He gives us a more complete account of Guido and his family. We learn all the miserable economies of Guido's home, how one of the sons entered the church, how the daughters are married, how Guido in the hope of a fortune, came to Rome and served a cardinal there for thirty years, and how, when he had been at last dropped from his service, he proposed to return to Arezzo, his ancestral home. He gives us the advice of Guido's brother Paolo that he should marry and so gain a little money to take home with him. He describes Guido's visit to the barber, who told him of Pompilia and Paolo's visit to Violante. Tertium Quid gives the details of Pompilia's visit to the hermit and the meditation of the hermit afterward. A certain friar, of mean degree, who heard her story in confession, wept, crossed himself, showed the man within the monk. Then will you save me, you the one in the world? I cannot even write my woes, nor put my prayer for help in words a friend may read. I no more own a coin than have an hour free of observance. I was watched to church, and watched now, shall be watched back presently. How by the skill of scribe i' the marketplace? Pray you write down and send whatever I say of the need I have my parents take me hence. The good man rubbed his eyes, and could not choose. Let her dictate her letter in such a sense that parents, to save breaking down a wall, might lift her over. She went back, heaven in her heart. Then the good man took counsel of his couch, woke and thought twice, the second thought the best. Here I am, foolish body that I be, caught all but pushing, teaching, who but I, my betters their plain duty. What, I dare help a case the archbishop would not help? Mend matters, peradventure, God loves ma. What hath the married life but strifes and plagues for proper dispensation? So a fool once touched the ark, poor Uzza that I am. 
O married ones, much rather should I bid impatience all of ye possess your souls. This life is brief, and troubles die with it. Where were the prick to soar up homeward else? So saying, he burned the letter he had writ, said Ave for her intention, in its place, took snuff and comfort, and had done with all. The fact of the murder we have known before, but Tertium Quid gives some details which make it vivid. We hear Pietro, as he bellows, Mercy for heaven, not for earth, leave to confess and save my sinful soul, then do your pleasure on the body of me. And we hear Guido reply, Nay, father, soul with body must take his chance. We see Pompilia as she rushes here and there like a dove among the lightnings in her break, and Guido, as he lifts her by the long dishevelled hair, holds her away at arm's length with one hand, while the other tries if life come from the mouth, looks out his whole heart's hate on the shut eyes, draws a deep, satisfied breath. So, dead at last, throws down the burden on dead Pietro's knees, and ends all with, Let us away, my boys. When Guido was arrested, he asked who told them twas he who did the deed, and, on hearing the reply, why, naturally your wife, he, drops of the horse he rode, they have to steady and stay, at either side, the brute that bore him, bound, so strange it seemed his wife should live and speak. Tertium Quid tells us, for the first time, of the decision of the Tuscan courts against Pompilia, of which Guido made all he could. All this is knowledge which a person of the superior social section might be supposed to have. As we examine further the character of Tertium Quid, we see that the person who speaks here has evidently taken great pains to acquire all possible information. He has no confidence in the ability of the law to get at the actual fact. He understands the mechanical and external methods it uses. He represents the superior class, and all that he says shows him to be one whose education fits him to take a more dispassionate view of the incidents in the case of Guido, while, at the same time, it shows him to be a man whose sympathies do not extend beyond his particular set. He is very considerate of those among whom he moves. He desires to do whatever will add to their pleasure, and to avoid whatever will cause them annoyance or inconvenience. For those outside his aristocratic circle, however, he has no concern. They are of another sort, and have nothing in common with people of his kind. He does not enter into the feelings of the people in his story. He scornfully refers to the mob, whose opinion is worthless compared with his. The trouble with people, he says, is that they forget that they are only dealing with the commonty. This is merely an episode in Burgess life, and people talk as if they had to do with a noble pair. To him, there are different codes for different sets of people, and he blames Pietro and Violante because themselves love themselves, although such a course is far from worst even for their betters. He describes them as human slugs and pauper saints. He thinks it would be better for the Pope to crush such people instead of feeding them. He has no patience with a woman like Violante, and says of her, Judge by the way she bore adversity or the patient nature you ask pity for. His account of the affair is impartial and balanced, but it lacks any real insight. Tertium Quid does not bring us a step nearer to the actual truth. He has information, but no sympathy with the parties about whom he is taking so much trouble to inform himself. Never, for a moment, does he catch a glimpse of the pure motive of Pompilia. It does not require, he thinks, all the malicious devices of Guido to cause her to flee with the priest, any more than it requires that Etna should vomit flames to melt an icicle. Her conduct can be explained by more obvious reasons. We must not want all this elaborate work to solve the problem why a young fancy and flesh slips from the dull side of a spouse in years, betakes it to the breast of brisk and bold, 
whose love scrapes furnish talk for all the town nor has tertium quid any conception of guido's real character he thinks he cannot be as bad as his enemies say he is he has been born bred and brought up in the usual way his mother loves him his brothers stand by him the archbishop and governor of his native town favour him he has been in the household of a cardinal who arranged his marriage such a one need not be a monster but only a mere man people he thinks are mistaken in regarding pompilia as an angel and guido as a demon perhaps the truth lies between pompilia may have been a little to blame while guido was inconsiderate in his treatment of her it is significant that his version of the story has no interest for those to whom he talks they wish to be somewhere else and he closes with the muttered remark you'll see i have not so advanced myself after my teaching the two idiots here after all the world cares very little for versions of events the balance between probabilities without any vital concern for the persons engaged in them it loves the plea of the advocate and the statement of one who puts his heart into what he says it is not regardless of the truth but with a correct instinct it feels that a speaker is not nearer to the real facts because of his indifference history is not correct because it is impartial and dull it may be that browning takes occasion in tertium quid to satirize the kind of history which depends more upon information painfully heaped up and compared in some external way than for the insight which through sympathy divines the real motives and characters of men and women the listeners to tertium quid no doubt thought he was clever but they knew he bored them so many praise the laborious compiler of mere facts but they do not read him interest belongs to the historian who cares for those of whom he writes end of chapter five